being a bassist, it's not to be taken lightly. In all music, you are the foundation. The drums keep the time, your piano has the harmony, but you gotta live in both of those worlds simultaneously. You can't take one off to go and, and deal with the other. And especially in the jazz context, it's all happening spur of the moment, so you gotta be right there. You have the power to elevate and also destroy with one incorrectly placed note. Take any of your favorite records and take the bass off. I guarantee you they don't sound that good anymore. There's just something about that duality of riding the line between the harmony and the rhythm that's just so important. I had a buddy, he got a guitar for Christmas. And I saw it and I said, this is great, I'll get a guitar too and we'll start a band. And he said, no, 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 I'm the guitar player, you need to play bass. So I went home and I said, dad, what's a bass? And he said, this is a bass. And he put on a Led Zeppelin DVD. John Paul Jones is in this white suit, massive shoulder pads. You know, he had this bass and he was just in, it's like a galloping bass line, like a dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da dun kind of thing. And I'm hearing this and I'm seeing this guy who looks so cool in this white suit. And I'm like, that's a bass? He says, yeah, that's a bass. And I said, okay, yeah, so that that's for me. to a Guitar Center Central Dallas, met a guy named Steve Morgan, who's still there. Steve Morgan, to this day, is one of my all-time favorite bass players. This man is unbelievable. I started with, with the P bass. We brought it home and my dad grabbed it. He started playing the bass line to Dazed and Confused. You know, you hear that sound, that sound of an iconic bass line that was also played on a Fender. It was just one of those moments where you know you're onto something. You know you're on the right track. You're doing the right thing the right way. The most recorded bass in the history of electric bass, the most number one hits were recorded on a P bass. The legacy of the electric bass started with the Fender Precision bass. I get accepted into a high school in Dallas called Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts. They had their classical program and they had the jazz program, which was kind of a flagship for the school. And at the time, like, I don't play any upright bass. I just want to play Led Zeppelin tunes. I just want to play metal tunes. The jazz director took one look at me and he was like, you got potential, but you got a lot of work to do. The record that did it was Wayne Shorter's record, Juju. That was the moment that really hit me like, okay, I get it now, I understand. I need to get an upright, I need to take this serious because this is serious music, this is serious business. But at first, it's hard. I used to be so frustrated listening to these records trying to hear what Paul Chambers was playing. Oh my God, I was frustrated, you know? That's one of the hard things about getting started in jazz on the bass because the recording technology the way it was, you have just buried, muffled tone that it's difficult to hear that when your ears are young. You know, you, you get older and you acquire more listening maturity you develop the ability to hear those sounds better. You kind of get over the hump of that. You start to understand what it's doing in context. You understand what the walking bass line in jazz does at surface level. Playing electric bass, you're the pulse. With the upright bass in jazz, you are an actual heartbeat. You are beating every beat, every quarter note. That's you. The electric kind of took a back seat and I started really focusing on the acoustic and that fortuitously turned into a full scholarship to Berklee College of Music. My second year there, I got a kind of a bad break and came down with tendonitis in my left forearm. So that's, that's kind of a deal breaker for the upright. <laughs> you know, it's such a physical instrument. It's hard to do that if you have an injury like that. I had to take some time off. I got back to the electric first in, in a few months. I never thought I'd be a six string player. I started doing these fusion gigs with my best friend, a great drummer from Dallas, Mike Mitchell, Black Dynamite. He had been playing in Stanley Clark's band for several years, and there he met a pianist from the, the Eastern European Republic of Georgia. Unbelievable pianist, Becca Gochiachvili. This was, this was my own limitation at the time, but I felt that, you know, an instrument that maybe was a little more suited to like a fusion thing where I'd be playing fast solos and stuff like that might be helpful. So I went out and, and got this Michael Tobias design MTD six string. And that became the main axis. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the six string, it gives me 
the ability to play notes in a range that people actually hear. I didn't think about that for a while, but non-bass players do not hear bass the way that we hear bass. Like, I hear a bass solo and I'm like, oh my god, they're killing! These ideas are crazy! But most people just hear like... Mm -hmm. And I think we forget that as bass players sometimes. So having the upper register, it all of a sudden I'm like, I can play ideas that pop now. It's not just low, rumbly, woofy, nobody but the musicians care ideas, you know? For the past few years, I've been fully and actively engaged on the acoustic and the electric bass. You know, the Fender P bass to me, that's the earth, that's the ground, that's Mother Earth that we walk on, you know, it's the root. The upright to me, the upright is the nighttime. The upright is hanging out at night and we're having a good time. We're meeting new people and there's nice music happening as well. I see the six string as an opportunity to be a, a lead voice. A lead voice that doesn't just scream, oh, it's the bass player and he's playing the melody now. Mm. I, see, I see that as an opportunity to have my voice heard, as it were. debut album just recently came out called Tbilisi, named after the capital city, the Eastern Republic of Georgia. It took a lot of different factors to put that album together. Aside from the obvious, you go into the studio, you track it, you put your music together, you mix it, you master it, you promo it. Aside from all of those very physical and tangible aspects of putting it together, I didn't necessarily see myself as a leader for a, for a good amount of time. I'm a bass player in the truest sense of the word. I love just getting in and holding it down. I love locking it in. I started like really aggressively writing. I'm just trying to make time every day to work on writing for this. I found that the more I got into it, the more I started working on it as a composer, the more I got into the process and, you know, finding maybe like a three or four note idea and like, how can I flesh this out? How, how can I turn this into something? And by the time we got to starting rehearsals, by the time we got to the recording sessions and I just decided, okay, I, I get it now. I understand that feeling of, I have music that I have to share with the world. So my model for Tbilisi was more or less follow the, the John Coltrane Quartet. I like piano, bass, tenor sax, and drums. I, I like how that unit sounds. You know, as a bass player, you, you live in, in two dualities at this day and age, where you have your, your down home, your James Jamerson, you are holding it down, you are making butts move. We have so many advanced solo artists that have taken the bass to new heights melodically, harmonically, what they do with the upper register. And I'm, I'm personally very interested in both. The other reason that I wanted to make sure to have a point of emphasis on everybody else in the squad is that there are a lot of bass records. It's a lot of bass solos. It's a whole lot of bass solos all over those records. And at the end of the day, that is their musical expression. There is nothing wrong with that. But I, I wanted to put a big emphasis on, I'm not just a guy who likes to go up high and solo all the time. I like to stay home, I like to play bass. I like to give other people the freedom to have their voice heard as well. Every time that I get to pick the bass up, every time that I get to sit down at the piano and compose, it's a gift. It's and not just the gift to be, to, to have the ear and the mind and the drive to pursue this craft and, and the creative element of music, just the ability that I get to pick the thing up and put it in my hands and it doesn't hurt, <laughs> that I can just let it flow and not have to think about what's happening with my body anymore. It's hard to put into words how grateful I feel for that every day, every time I pick it up. I need music the same way I need water. You might be able to make it a couple of days without it, but it's, it's essential. There's very little in my experience that is as all-encompassing as music is. Doesn't matter where you go on the planet, doesn't matter who you talk to, everybody loves music. <laughs>